Okay, open up your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2, and we will be looking at verses 18 through 24. Now, we'll continue on with the subject of submission. Someone said, helicopters don't fly. You look, you look like you're bewildered a little bit. What do you mean they don't fly? They just beat the air into submission. In our natural flesh, we, we're not submissive people. We're just not. None of us are. The only way to be a submissive person is, is to be in love with Jesus and to have a heart for God. To be filled with the Holy Spirit that you are submitted to Him. Because really, ultimately, it's not submission to government as we saw last week or submission to employers that we'll see this week or submission to your husbands as we'll see next week. It is really submission to God. It really is. That's the whole foundation of submission is our submission to God and what He has said in His Word. And I think we understand that. The hard part is applying that where it needs to be applied in government, in our employers, and in our relationships, even in submitting one with another. And so if you are going to pray that God helps you in that area of submission because you know you're not submissive in your flesh or you're not a submissive person, then then really the prayer should be that we are submissive to God first. And I think that when we're submissive to Him and in love with Him and filled with the Holy Spirit, then the others just fall into place. It's easier to do because you are so in love with God and you trust Him completely with your life. And so we're going to continue on with this subject of submission or humiliation or humbleness. Humbleness. Being humble in the place that God has you. You know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and He created a man and He created a woman. He created Adam and then He created Eve. Now, some of us ask, why was I created? Why was I created a man? And why was I created a woman? What's the answer to that question? I don't know why. There's things that we just don't know why God has done. And you might be a woman... And you might be saying, I wish I was a man. And you might be a a man and wish that you were a woman. And not in a bad sense, just in the sense that we really don't like our roles in life. We rebel against what God has created us to be. Whether woman or man, whether in the job that we have, whether in the place that we live, or whether in the relationships that we have. We have just a rebellious heart towards all those truths. You know, they, like they say, you know, if you get your hair cut, you don't like it. If you don't get it cut, you don't like it. We just don't like it at all. You know, um, I'm sure that there are a lot of ladies here that probably tried on about three different outfits before you even came to church. You know, because you just don't like the outfits you wore. I, I remember there was a lady here and her husband would say, they're, they're always late. And they only lived across the street at the time. But she tried on like 13 different outfits. You know, before she even came to church. And so, you know, we just don't like the way we are. We don't like who we are. And we struggle with that within ourselves. And reality is, is we're struggling with God. Because what we're saying is we don't like who God has made us. And we have to be sincere with Him and say, Lord, you know that I struggle with this area whether it's being male or female, or whether it's being where I'm working or in the place that I'm at. But Lord, I want to have that peace. I want to know that you have me right where you want me to be. That you created me to be who you wanted me to be. And being subjected to God in that area. Last week we stopped at verse 17, where Peter instructed us to honor people, to love the brotherhood, to fear God, and to honor kings. And very clear instructions that we're to honor all people. Humanity. They are God's creation and we need to respect God's creation. We need to love God's creation. And I'm talking about humanity. 
You know, they're all created in God's image. And they all need Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior. And we need to honor all people. We need to love the brotherhood. That is, those that are Christian believers. That believe in the fundamentals of Christianity. That believe this is the Word of God. And that we must be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. And now, as born again believers, we desire to be used of God in the kingdom of God. And we need to love our brothers and sisters in the Lord. And then we're to fear God or reverence God because He is God. He sits upon the throne. He created everything and truly He deserves honor and praise every day of our lives. And then He ends with honoring the king or those that are in charge and those that are in authority. And so in context, he's, He last week was speaking about subjection to government, to authority within our society. And that's a good thing for us as we saw because government and <clears throat> police and, and those in authority are there to protect us from society so that, that we don't cause harm or that others don't cause harm to us. But not only that, that we live in a, a place in an area that's safe for our children and for our lives and that we prosper you know, in this great country of ours. And we have all that. In this great country. And so now we come to verses 18 through 21, where in context he's regarding a servant's submission, that he would continue as previously instructed towards government, so, but now submitting ourselves to, to uh, our employers, or in this case to masters. And we notice in verse 13 that it's for the Lord's sake that we humble ourselves under every human institution. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through this. So, this same motivation would be for the Lord's sake, by the way. I mean, we apply to the institution of slavery as to masters. Now, that brings up a question. When Peter is talking about masters and slaves, well, we don't live in a society with masters and slaves anymore. You know? And so, does this apply to us? Is this a, a part of Scripture, you know, that really doesn't apply to us? Why are we reading it? Why are we concerned about it? Because Peter's really talking about masters who own slaves. And we don't live in that type of society. Again, the, the underlying principle is submission. A submission to God, submission to authority, submission to those that you work for, and submission to uh, your spouses, one to another, and, and to your husbands and so forth. So the principle is still there. We don't have slavery, at least in this country. We do have slavery in other countries. Now, we do have employer-employees um, type of relationships. And I really believe, and we'll get to it in the text here, that that's what he's talking about. Because he's not talking about slaves out there owned by individuals working their land and so forth. But he's talking about ho household slaves. Those that have freely enslaved themselves to them for a price so that their families can survive. So in other words, they are getting paid for what they do. And they live within the households. And you'll see that during that time, there were doctors, there were lawyers, there were secretaries, uh, there were <coughs> the educated people that worked for them, in a sense, who were considered slaves, and they worked for them in their households. So Peter continues on the subject of submissiveness. Servants, be subject to your masters. Now, he uses the word servant there, which again, as I just said, is the word household servant in verse 18. Let's read the context so that we get the idea of, of what he's saying here. Now, there's two, there's two outlines here. One is that we're to submit to our masters. And the second one is he gives us an example in Christ Jesus and how he submitted to the Father in heaven. So let's, let's go ahead and read Read the rest of this chapter. Servants, be subject to, the mas to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable. If because of conscience towards God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer for it, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called... You were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled did not revile back in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. 
who himself bore our sins in our own in his own body on a tree that we having died to sin might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed for you were like sheep gone going astray but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul so you get the context there so he's speaking to servants here household servants uh, they were Christian slaves serving in the homes of pagan masters. That is, their masters did not believe in Christ. They were Roman citizens and they had all kinds of various different beliefs. They believed in dis- different gods and, and, and idols and so forth and they worshipped them. And they would get these Christians. Now, why Christians? Because Christians were submissive. Christians had a purpose. They were to be light and salt to the community. And Christians learned how to work hard and so forth. And so they were valuable to those that could hire them to serve in their household. The word servant here is is okus, which means house, means one who lives in the same house as another, and then household slaves or domestic servants. So in a sense, they lived in the home itself. They, they would sometimes even have a separate room for them where they would stay. There were roughly about six million slaves during the time that Peter wrote this epistle. And many, many of these household or domestic slaves were educated and held responsible positions in these households. Many of them were doctors, as I said, teachers, musicians, actors, and stewards over their master's estate. And so they were educated individuals. The living conditions of these slaves were often better than those who were free, who had to sleep outside on the streets and live um, their life there. And so these were more uh, domesticated slaves that were more free than really those that were free. Now, Peter gives us instructions to servants or our application should be towards employee Ers as employees. If you are an employer, you have certain responsibilities, and we'll see that. If you are an employee, then there are certain responsibilities. And Peter is instructing us right now on us being employees. So let's take it from that perspective. Be sub- subject submissive in the next statement. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear. This is an instruction. This is not a suggestion. But this is an instruction and a commandment that we are to submit ourselves to our masters in fear or to our bosses. The word submissive there is the same word that he uses for our submissiveness to government, where we put ourselves under them. Again, don't get the idea that they are better than us. Don't get the idea that, that they are elite No, we're equal in the sight of God. We just have different positions. That's it. They have the position of being the boss. We have the position of being the employee. So we have the responsibility as an employee to submit ourselves in fear of God to our bosses. And of course, the word master there indicates somebody that has ownership or authority over an individual. Now, in a sense... Back then, masters is one who had that legal control over that person, and so they were to be subjective to them. Now, Paul takes the same idea, and he tells Timothy in 6.1, all who are under the yoke of slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor. Now, that's a little different than what Peter is saying here. When you look at your boss, you are to respect them in honor because they have that position as your boss. And it's important that we understand that. That if we are employees, then we too are to look at our employers as those with honor. Because in a sense, they're taking care of us and many others by employing them and providing for them and for their household. He goes on and says, so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. And unfortunately, that's sad that when we live in a day and age where Christians are not submissive to their employers, what happens is that all the other employees, uh, others then start to talk about how Christians are not submissive, how they're rebellious, how why would I want to become a, a Christian? This gospel of Christ and it changing you and you being born again, that's a bunch of nonsense because you're sinners too. I remember one guy saying to me when I was trying to share with him, he's saying to me, everybody has a skeleton in their closet. 
I go, you're right. We too. I go, the only thing is, is that we've opened up our closet and let God into it. And hopefully he's cleaning out our closet. You just keep hiding it from everyone. You know, I mean, they're, they're right. They look at us as believers and, and they're going to find fault if they can find fault. Anything that they can find fault in so that they don't have to believe. And so then they blasphemy the word of God. And that really shouldn't be. We shouldn't be a part of that. You know, you get on Facebook and you see people that are supposedly Christians and they got margaritas and drinks like that. And their friends are watching this and looking at it and say, wait a minute, I thought they were a Christian. And they're partying. You know, that's sad. That's a bad witness, we would call. They're not light. They're not salt. What are they really reflecting? Darkness. Darkness. And that's sad because with their mouth they're proclaiming to be light, but in the sense, through their actions, they're really showing what they are, and that is darkness. Paul said the same thing to Titus 2.9. Urge bondservants to be subject to their own masters in everything, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative. Not argumentative. We shouldn't be arguing with our bosses. We have a job to do. You're in charge. Tell me what to do, and I will do it. I'm not going to argue with you. you know, if it goes wrong, that's your responsibility, not mine. I just did what you said. And, and I understand all the particulars. That It's difficult you know, to, to talk about all the particulars because I've seen a lot of particulars. You know, Well, what if you have a boss and then his boss comes to you and tells you to do something, but your boss told you to do something else. What do you do? What do you do? Those are hard things to you know, to decipher and to do. And sometimes you decide, well, his boss told me, so I'm going to do it because ultimately he's my boss or I'm going to do what my boss says. So which one do I follow? And so that's where you, I think sometimes wisdom comes where you get clarification. You go to your boss and say, look, your boss just told me to do this. What do you want me to do? I don't know if I'll what my boss said. You know, that would be the wise thing for him to say. So really getting clarification. You know, but not going, oh, there they go again. They don't even know what they're doing. You know, and all this complaining and arguing. Just do your job. Just do your job because at the end of the week you get your paycheck and you get to go home. And enjoy, you know, the fruit of your labor. So, we shouldn't be argumentative. With all respect, Peter could have stopped with servants be submissive, but he adds that qualifying phrase there. And so he goes on with this instruction. It says, not only to the good and gentle. So not only to those that, that have an, a genuine goodness in them. Because there are bosses that are genuinely good. They want to help people and take care of people. And it's just in their hearts. And, and they have the ability to do that through their business and so forth. And they're gentle. You know, they're not harsh. And they're speaking to you and, and, and in their direction uh, you know, of leading you and so forth. They're not these type of bosses that are more you know, stringent and rigorous and so forth. But they're able to communicate gently and lovingly and they care about your family and so forth. In fact, many times uh, these corporations, what they'll do is they'll hire other people. And they'll say, if you can create a family atmosphere, then you can have a great environment and then you have production within that atmosphere if you can do that. Now, now that's ideally, you know, you would think you'd have that in your own household, that family atmosphere, and yet we can't even produce it there. So, I mean, that's an ideal thing to have, you know, but it doesn't always happen because you have an ugly duckling, you know. You have someone that's always rebellious and someone doesn't like the way things are going and so forth. So it's just a difficult thing to do. But ideally, it's a good thing to try to do, even within the church, you know, if we can create family, we can have agape feast, and we can create unity and get everyone focused on the same vision, not just to come in and leave, but that we have a purpose here and that we're trying to reach the community, that we should fill these, these churches, these church chairs up. You know, that should be the vision, but we don't always get that. Because some don't want to be involved. They just want to come in, they want to leave. They want Christianity to be, you saved me, now I can just live the way I want and not do anything. And, and I'm going to heaven. And so that's what, how they come into church. And others who, yeah, I can stick around, I can fellowship, because they have that personality. Others are very shy, and so forth. How do you get them all on the same page? Ideally, you know, in Christ and through the Spirit, when we have that fellowship and we're submitted to God, that will work. It definitely will work. Acts chapter 2 tells us that it works. But we need to submit ourselves to God. So, not just to the gentle, but notice he says, but also to the harsh. Ay, 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 that's hard, isn't it? 
to those bosses that are harsh. You know, they, they, they come and they're watching you all the time. Why aren't you working? Why are you just talking? Get busy. We got money to make. You know, that, that type of boss. Now that's a contrast from good and gentle to harsh. And yet, the instruction here for us is that we are to submit ourselves even to the harsh. Now, how do you do that? I, I've had harsh bosses. I, I've had those bosses that are very harsh. You know, and so what you do is you get out of their way. Out of sight, out of mind. You know, if you have a job, like for instance, my job, I would come in in the morning and prepare my work and then I would leave. Some guys, they like to come in the morning, like to talk. They like to go walking around and see different secretaries and come back and forth and their friends, you know, and then they sit back down and, you know, they should be gone in a, within a half an hour and it's an hour already and the boss is coming in and going, what are you guys still doing in here? Why aren't you out there working? And so when you have a boss like that, then you come in and you get your work ready. If not the day before, you come in, you grab your stuff and you're out. You're out the door, you know, and you're in your vehicle. And you're out in the yard where he can't see you. And then you can talk a little bit, you know, and then drive off and do your work. Because if you're out of sight, you're out of mind. You know, so those harsh bosses are always looking and so forth. So just being sensitive to that. Get out of their way. When they're, when they're in the room, leave. Best thing to do. Leave, go do something else. Prepare somewhere else and so forth. You just find ways of, of getting around those things. I mean, there are obviously going to be times when you can't. And so you just listen. You, know, you just listen. Um, we had a boss that um, he, he he was a Nazi. This guy was just a Nazi guy, man. Uh, he 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 wanted he had it all in his head. When we would all park our vehicles, he he told everybody, "I want you to back in, and I want you to take your cone. I want you to put it right on the left hand side, right at the bumper, so everybody looked like all uniform." That, that was his whole thing, you yeah. know, and so forth. Well. <laughs> Being young myself and a friend of mine, uh, we had that rebellious spirit. Now, I'm not saying that I was always a submissive person. I mean, we all struggled with it, and this before Christ came into my life. And so this guy would go out, literally, and he would follow us. He would literally follow us. And so he had followed my friend, and my friend had his test equipment in his truck, and he was out looking, scouting where the location of the of the uh, job was and so forth. And Well, the boss comes around, and the Back was open, so he pulled his equipment, put it in his car, and took off and just hit around the corner. Well, my friend saw him do this. He's like, why would he do that? I mean, you know, why would you do something like that to an employee? So he got into his truck, closed everything up, and just went out and sat in a restaurant for the whole day. He just sat there. And so the boss, at the end of the day, as he comes in, he just comes in with this, my friend, and just sits down. And the boss goes, so how was your day? He goes, oh, it was good. He goes, really? So did you get some jobs done? Well, no. Why not? He goes, because I didn't have any test equipment. He goes, what happened? He goes, I saw you take it. That's what happened. <laughs> so I figured you told me to take the day off. And so I took the day off. You know, and this was the type of thing that would go on in the office quite often. Quite often, I mean, this guy was a harsh boss. I remember one time I came in and, you know, I'm a surfer dude. I, I grew up in Roland Heights in high school. Went to Huntington Beach all my life. I used to drive my bike down there. And so I would go to work without socks. You know, I'd have bands on and I, you know, wouldn't wear socks. One day he, he sees me. He's on the phone. And he just like stops and says, I can't believe this. He screams it out. I have one of my guys wearing no socks. I can't believe this. Like the world was coming to an end. You know, so I'm like, what's going on? So he hung up the phone. He goes, I'll call you later. I got to deal with this great situation, you know. And and so, you know, he came up to me. He says, why aren't you wearing socks? I go, I don't never wear socks. Don't you understand? You work for the Southern California Edison. You represent this company. And when customers see you, they're getting an image. I go, well, I don't see them looking at my feet. You know, I don't, I don't lift my pants up and say, hey, do you see I have socks on? I mean, you can't see. He goes, go home, put socks on right now. You know, that's the type of boss that he was. So I, I went home. I did what he said. Of course, I took my time, you know. And then finally, when I got back, he wanted to not pay me for that. I go, wait a minute. You instructed me to do that, so you have to pay me. So then the union had to get involved. You know, and you can play all those games, or you can just be submissive. You know, you don't need all that drama. You know, what we need is, is to be a light. Now, when Christ came into my life, 
that all stopped. That all stopped. Because I understood what submissive meant. So I was totally submissive. And I remember him one day calling me into the office and he said to me, he says, you've changed. I go, yeah, I have. He goes, yeah, I've noticed it. You're not arguing. You're not fighting with me. You're not resisting. None of that. I go, yeah, you know why? He goes, no, why? And I shared the gospel with him. I shared the gospel with him. I told him Jesus Christ came into my heart. You know, he became my Lord and Savior. And so he's like, wow, I go, and you need him. He goes, oh, it works for you, and <clears throat> I don't think it'll work for me, you know, that type of thing. But they, he saw it instantly, you know. And, and you change because you want to please the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is a witness to them. So we're to be submissive, even to harsh bosses. Verse 19, for this is commendable, he said, or favorable, some of your Bibles might say. Well, what is? If because of conscience towards God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. So if you endure the suffering, the grief, the harassment, you know, and you endure it and you're patient and you're trusting in God, it's great. It's commendable for you to do that. Now, I want you to notice something in that statement. If because of conscience towards God, that is such a powerful statement there that we miss if we don't really grab hold of it. And that statement spans beyond just submission. It is, our, it is about our relationship with God. That word conscience in the Greek is suidis, which means son, which equals with, edo, which means no. So it's literally knowing with knowledge. So you understand what is going on. So... <coughs> <laughs> because of conscience towards God. And because you know God. Because you know God, you endure grief, suffering, and wrongfully. You see, when you have a relationship with God, when you are born again and then you're spirit filled, then you know God and you know His heart and you know what He wants of you and expects of you. And then it becomes easy. So then you endure patiently. You endure and you love and you submit because you're not pleasing the person you're submitting to. You're pleasing God because he is the whole reason that you're doing it because he's the one that saved your soul from the pit of hell. And so now, because of conscience sake, it comes naturally. Unnaturally is this. Take an apple tree and try to squeeze an orange out of it. You can't. You can't. You can wait all year long and get to summer and, and there will never be an apple off your orange tree. But what comes naturally? An orange. And there's no effort at all. You just water it and all of a sudden you go, oh, look, there's an orange. Yeah, didn't, he wasn't there, you know, shaking around and nobody was trying to beat the trunk. You know, they used to tell you, beat the trunk of the tree. Gets in to produce fruit and so forth. You know, <laughs> it's natural. An orange tree will produce oranges. A Christian will produce light and salt righteousness it will be patient at times grab that i underline that uh, that goes along with john chapter 3 you know unless you are born again you cannot enter the kingdom of god uh, first first corinthians or second corinthians 5:17 unless you are a new creature in christ jesus you know the old things pass away behold all things are new and these come naturally because of the spirit of god that lives within you so because of conscious sake, uh, the NIV puts it that way because he is conscious of God. The ESV puts it when mindful of God. Uh, another translation says because of the conscious sense of his relationship to God. Montgomery says from a sense of duty to God. So it's all centered around God and your relationship with God. Anytime you begin to work in the flesh... Get angry and argumentative and you're not submissive. It's all done outside of the realm of God. Outside of the spiritual realm. You're doing everything in the flesh. And that's not Christianity. So, what should motivate a Christian employee to be submissive uh, to the employer is a desire to please God. Desire to please God. Uh, why are we submissive to government? A desire to please God. Why are we to employees? Employers, desire to please God. Why to our husbands? A desire to please God. 
why to one another in the church? A desire to please God. So Peter continues now with this idea of suffering. Verse 20. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your fault, you take it patiently? Now, I deserved it. You know, I was rebellious when I used to work. And I would do things purposely against this guy. You know, um, I would find out what really made him mad. And then I would purposely do stuff. And so when he would retaliate, there was a good reason for that. You know, because I was acting unsubmissively. And so I had, he had the right to do that and take action against me. Uh, in the state of California, I don't know if you're aware of this, but we have the <coughs> law that if an employer wants to fire an individual, he can fire them for anything. It doesn't matter. You can fight it all you want, but there's a law stating that as long as it's stated in your procedures and so forth. <clears throat> and it's good for you too because then you can also quit anytime you want if you're harassed and so forth, like, things like that. Now what Peter's saying here is that what credit is to you if you're causing problems, then you're going to receive the results of those problems. It's no credit at all. It's not commendable, in other words. And God sees that. That's, that's what's the irony here. When you're not a submissive person, God sees what you're doing and how is he going to bless you? How is he going to bless you when you're not submissive? He can't. He's waiting for you to understand the principle of submission. You know, we think that we're giving up our rights to an individual, you know, and we're not. We're giving up our position to God and saying, God, you're in control of my life. And so whatever you think is best for me. And by the way, God, I know I don't deserve anything because I'm a sinner. And there are none righteous. I deserve death, God. You didn't even have to save me, but yet you saved me. You know, I don't even, I don't even deserve to be blessed, to drive a car, to wear a suit. I, I don't deserve any of these things. Well, that's the negative attitude. No, it's the truth. It's the truth. We don't deserve nothing. We are nothing. When we understand that, then we can be content with what God has given us. And know that we are everything in His eyes because He loves us. He died for us. We're His children. And He wants the best for us. And we can submit ourselves to what He wants for us. So now He gives us a contrast. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. In other words, God sees what you are going through. And God is happy and pleased because of that. And so therefore, Peter says, for this is or for to this you were called. We were called to do this. Submit to our employers. Whether good or evil or whether harsh, we're called to do this. It's a commandment. It's not a suggestion. You want to know how to overcome our reluctance to submit? It's easy. Submit. And then battle the feelings and emotions inside, the pride that goes on. When you just submit and, and you're going, man, I wish I didn't do that. Oh, this is not fair. You fight those battles. And eventually what happens is, is that you resolve that within yourself. Because the battle's within you, nowhere else. Once that's resolved, once that's taken care of, then the next time you just submit, like, okay. Whatever, and then you go on with life having peace and rest in your life. And you're not this b person battling with yourself constantly, which takes up too much time. You'd be doing better things, just submitting yourselves. For this is, for to this you were called, he said. Called to suffer, really is what he's saying here. Now Peter gives us the example as he ends that portion within context submitting ourselves to masters to employers whether good or evil or harsh and then he ends with suffering then he gives us an example of suffering he says in the next statement there in verse 21 because christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that we or you should follow in his steps see jesus suffered he endured the cross, the mockery, the ridicule. And so if he suffered, submitting himself to the government, the Roman Empire, employers, the, the royal priesthood, and Jesus was a part of the priesthood because he was born of, of that tribe. 
He was, he said in Hebrews that he's a high priest, you know. He's submitting himself to those things. He humbly submit himself to all of that, which sets us an example that we should walk in his footsteps. <coughs> Whenever you take your kids to the beach, you know, you, you walk in the sand and you put those big old footsteps in the sand. You ever see your kids walk in your footsteps? They're like jumping, getting their footsteps. Ah, I'm walking in dad's footsteps. You know, they're not leaving their own footsteps. So Peter's saying, Jesus walked this way, so we should be walking this way. In the suffering of Christ. Now, notice, <coughs> I'm to follow his steps, verse 22. Who committed no sin. Now he qualifies this, that he suffered as an example to us, but Christ, who is pure and perfect and holy, really didn't deserve to be ridiculed and mocked and suffer because he knew no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Only Christ could claim that. There was nothing in him that was deceitful. There was no sin that he committed. He was tempted, but he never committed sin whatsoever. Peter had lived a close relationship with Jesus. He could say that because you live long enough with a person and guess what? You're going to find their faults. You go to church long enough and guess what? You're going to see my faults. You can't get around that because we're human beings and we all have faults. We all struggle. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And so you would think Peter would have saw Jesus' faults, but he didn't. He said, this guy's sinless. He's never sinned. He's always had the right motive, right heart, did things for the right reasons. He's not even a person that's, um, he uses the word, deceit. Or uses guile. In other words, he doesn't manipulate situations or individuals. We do that. We manipulate. You know, sometimes I feel like that. Uh, how do I motivate people to get involved? In a sense, you're find a, finding a way to manipulate them without them knowing it, you know. And oftentimes I just have to resolve because I've tried every which way and it doesn't work. <laughs> it's just, Lord, you have to get a hold of their hearts. That's the only way. God has to get a hold of hearts. I can't. I can't get a hold of your heart. I, I can try to disciple you. Boy, I, I've done this. I've discipled an individual and poured my heart into him. And boom, they take off. They're gone. For, because of my faults. Oh, they can't take my faults. Bad decision. You know, maybe you're not called. Okay, I'm not. See you later. You know, and you pour your heart into them. And you try that. And then I tried the opposite. Like, I'm not going to pour nothing into them. I'm just going to let God do it. They're still around. They're still around. Like, okay, what, what do I... Just don't get involved. Let God take care of what He needs to take care of. Let God be their God and not me. And so that's a balance that I have to find as, as a pastor, you know? So I don't want to get too involved in your life. I want to let God get involved in your life. And hopefully, if you're sincere and you really want to know God and follow God, then He'll do the rest. It just falls into place because what? We all read the same book. And so we're all reading the same book and we're being conformed to what it's saying. Then we become like-minded people. So he goes on. <laughs> no deceit was found in his mouth. He says, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. So they reviled him. They mocked him. But he never said a word. Didn't revile back at them. You know. We do that, don't we? We'll say, well, you did this. Well, I remember three years ago when you did that. And we revile back. It's our, our nature. God didn't do that. I mean, he could have easily said, you're mocking me? Okay, let's start from your birth. <laughs> Let me tell you what I know about you. <laughs> easily. He could have done that, but he didn't. There was no need to. See, that's putting your faith and trust in God. That God is your defender. He says, when he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him, who judges righteously. Underline that. Who did he commit himself to? To the Father. He didn't have to commit himself to anyone else. The Bible says that he, he went as a lamb to the slaughter. You know, whenever you, you, you look at a lamb, a lamb is a, is a timid little animal. And a lamb is not aware of what's going on around them. And when you would offer them up as a sacrifice, they wouldn't even know what you were doing. They would just kind of bah, follow you and going around the table. They put their head on the table and like, bah, what are you going to do to me? Bah. And all of a sudden, you're done. See, they don't say a word. You know, they're not expecting anything. And that's Jesus, a lamb to the slaughter. Never said a word. 
understood exactly that his father was in control of his life. That's the key, is committing ourselves to him, that is to Jesus Christ, as we follow in his footsteps. Verse 24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on a tree. The word tree there is not really the word tree, it's more literally wood. A cross was made out of wood. And Peter's just referencing the fact that Jesus was on wood when he was crucified. And who did he bore his sins for? For us. He was our sin offering. Couldn't be Peter. Peter wasn't pure and holy. Peter was a sinner. So were the religious leaders. They were hypocrites. Nobody could do this but Christ himself who was sinless. He could take our place and he bore our place upon the cross. That we having died to sin might live righteous by whose stripes you were healed. Now here's his instruction there to qualify what he's been saying. He's saying now look, you submit yourself to government, submit yourself to your employers. Let me give you an example. Christ submitted himself to the Father, to the government, to his employers. He suffered at the hands of men. He entrusted his Father with his life. He never reviled back. He never fought back. He just did what God the Father had told him to do. And then he says, now you again, having died to sin, that you might live to righteousness. So you, God died for you and you gave your life to him. And and you are no longer tied to sin. You're set free from sin. We saw that last week. We're no longer slaves to it. It doesn't control us. And so we can submit ourselves righteously. Because of what God has done for us. By his stripes you're healed. And, and so if you get whipped, God will heal you. Spiritually or physically, God will heal you. And Peter's using it within that context. You go back to Isaiah 53. And Isaiah talks about the offering, the sacrifice uh, that was wounded for our iniquities, for our chastisement. And yet by his offer, offering on the cross, his stripes and his beaten, we were healed. By his stripes, spiritually and physically also. None of us have been whipped into subjection. How does a helicopter fly? Because it beats the air into submission. None of us have been there. None of us have been there. We are to submit because we love the Lord. Let me close. The problem of taking advantage of one's employer, it it still exists today. We do it all the time. People still take advantage of their employers. Uh, They they steal time by not working. They steal items from their employer, which cost them something. Uh, These are things that happen all the time. And it's sad. As believers, it shouldn't be a part of our lives. Some think that because their bosses are Christians, that they have the right to slough off the job. No, we don't have that right. If they are Christians, we'll see later on that masters have a responsibility to their employees. Peter is saying that God expects Christians to be the best workers a boss can have. It's plain and simple. The believer is to give his employer a full day's work and to work hard at it. It's a matter... It matters not whether the boss is unfair or whether he's a miserable person and harasses or not. Christianity uh, should make us more conscientious than any other system at all because we serve our God, a God of love and grace. And the whole purpose is what? Salvation. That we would reach these people with the gospel. That they would see that there's a difference in us than in anyone else. That's the whole purpose of being submissive. Because Jesus, when he was submissive on the cross, what was he doing? He was paving the way for eternal life. So that if we believe in his work, we have eternal life. And so submission is tied into eternal salvation. When we submit ourselves to God, we're saved. Because we're submitting to his work and his plan, his way and not our way. And we have eternal life. Let's bow our heads.